What can you do when your local river is being pushed to the brink? It's terrifying to realise that nature's police are looking the other way. Soraya is just one of many volunteers who gives up their free time in the fight for Britain's waterways. She's a member of Windrush Against Sewage Pollution, a campaign group using science to hold water companies to account. Let's find out why. So we, we're just a couple of hundred metres up from where the Windrush finishes its journey and, and flows into the Thames. And uh, we're about a kilometre downstream from the last of the six treatment works. And I think what, what we're seeing here is a really interesting example of eutrophication. So a river that is overloaded with nutrients. This should be a gin clear river. The gravel should be golden. And as you can see today, it's, it's coated, it's brown, it's gray, it's almost black in places um, with, with algae. This is utterly devoid of any kind of healthy plant life. It makes me angry beyond belief that it's something that is so vital to both our health and the health of the environment around us is, is being neglected. It's terrifying to realise that the people you thought were there to help protect something so precious are, are not actually doing their job. It seems to me nature's police are looking the other way and I think there's no other way to respond other than to, to jump in and, and uh, if they're not going to do that job of working out what the problem is then as citizens we have to now driving up towards um, Stan Lake Sewage Treatment Works. It's about a, a kilometre from where we were and we're going to go in and, and have a look at the outfall there. Never thought I'd own a pair of these. It would be a kind of just maybe slightly below average size works if you look at all the treatment works across the country and there's about 7,000 of those. Um, this would be kind of just slightly slightly smaller than average so there'd be hundreds like this right across right across uh, England. Campaign groups like WASP believe testing is vital to monitor what's going into the rivers and the impact it's having. So we can uh, take some samples from the outfall. Yeah. We're going to take a look at phosphate, nitrate and ammonia levels. But nutrients in a small amount are a good thing but if you put too many of them into a uh, into a river or into a lake you get an overgrowth of algae that chokes the plants you get sediment coating the gravel and it impacts the entire ecosystem it blocks light plants die you lose the invertebrates you lose the fish and these changes are very a very telltale of an overload of nutrients as far as i know this isn't spilling right now so technically this works is behaving as it should but I'm not sure that as it should is anywhere near good enough. Yeah, this is this is treated based. So what what is in there is well hopefully we, we'll get a better idea when we do some of our testing, but but treating sewage doesn't mean that all the nasties are taken out. This wastewater isn't the raw sewage that plants like this often put into the river, but it still impacts the ecosystem significantly. So I'm going to do a phosphate test first. So we use these little handheld pocket checkers. So that's flashing 2.5. Um, that means that the phosphate here is above the range of my phosphate checker. Um, and I can only tell you that this is a high level of phosphate pollution, um, but we need a, a, a more powerful meter to, to tell us exactly how much phosphate is in there. Our family, we pay Thames Water to treat our waste. And I'm not really happy that this is what is happening with that, that money that I'm spending. So this, this is uh, an ammonia meter and we're going to look at the levels of ammonia in the outfall water here. You can tell instantly that there's, there's a high level of ammonia here. Okay, so we've got a reading of 2.07 milligrams per litre of ammonia. But this is showing us the relatively constant chronic pollution of ammonia that is just going straight into the river here. So the EA is, is really struggling to kind of keep up with, with monitoring not just the activity of water companies, but the health of our rivers in general. They don't have the funding and the teams in place. Since 2009, the water companies have been given what's called um, operator self-monitoring status. And somewhere like Stand Lake, 
they only have to take samples to report to the EA four times a year. So you know, we're here a lot more often than that. Well, I'm just waiting on the results for our nitrate now. So that's the third of the nutrients that we're looking at. Okay, so that's giving us a reading of 23 milligrams per litre of nitrate. Nitrate is a really important nutrient to think about when we're, when we're talking about um, overloading of, of our waterways. It's something that farmers come under a huge amount of pressure for and yet there is absolutely no limit on nitrate for any wastewater treatment works in this country. Um, if we listen to the companies, what they say, if you go to a website like Discover Water, for example, what happens after I flush? If I click on that, in some areas, the water, this is really interesting, the water put back into the environment can improve water quality in rivers and streams, <laughs> helping to keep them healthy. Okay, so I've got a question. Is this water going back in here? Is that helping keep this river healthy? I kind of want to cry. Who wrote this? <laughs> Who wrote this? I really, you know, I think there's some really important things that are out there in the public domain that really need challenging. So I often, often hear it uh, said that the problems with our uh, sewage treatment uh, works and infrastructure is that it's Victorian and it's out of date. I'm really confused by that. I can understand how that makes sense maybe perhaps in the centre of London, but there's nothing Victorian about this. With her testing at Stan Lake completed, Soraya hopes to collect data from one more site. On the way, she's joined by Victoria, another member of WASP, who has grave concerns about the future of transparency by water companies. I'm Victoria, and um, I contacted WASP because I saw their leaflet in a brochure in the butchers, and I read about this unpermitted spilling and the uh, lack of awareness, uh, or at least lack of enforcement, by the Environment Agency to do anything about it. And I thought, this can't be right. I had a public law background, a regulatory policy background, a legal background, and I thought, there must be a way. There are channels for this, so I got involved. Uh, and it's been very interesting and also terrifying, actually, to realise the lack of um, engagement, really, upon this issue by the water companies, by the Environment Agency. There's a bill going through Parliament now, and the big worry about this, it's the fallout from Brexit. One of the downsides is that the environmental information regulations under which we have been able to obtain the data from the water companies to expose their spills could be under the power solely of ministers who could disband this system. And it's of great concern that this analysis would no longer be able to be continued so that we could not expose through the media and through the law what's actually going on. What makes me really sad is that we're dealing with the after effects of a culture of greed and neglect that means that corporations can pollute for profits. It's cheaper to pollute our rivers than to invest in infrastructure. And the other reality is that all the legislation we need to prevent this kind of pollution already exists. We don't need any new laws. We need enforcement of what is already there. Thames Water said they have a turnaround plan for the next eight years, which they say will fix the basics, raise the bar and shape the future, and are spending £1.6 billion in the next two years to tackle the issue. You can read their full response in the description below.